everyone to Strategy Gaming Dojo, where we find, learn, and play one more turn of the great strategy games. Now today, I'm super excited, we are going to start a Let's Play for Gary Grigsby's War in the East. And you'll see here I'm hovering over the Pripyat Marshes, uh, ready to lead our troops into battle. Uh, but there is a lot that is going to be going on before we actually start moving. Uh, I really want to start this from the ground floor. We're going to go through every decision, how we make it, why we're making it, what the thought process is anyway, and then begin to move the German, the Axis, the, pa the Panzers will be flying across Russia, hopefully. Uh, but first of all, we've got a few things that we're going to have to set up, get ready, uh, think about. Uh, there will also be the air war that starts before the ground war. Uh, we will want to try to destroy a very big proportion of the Soviet air force on the ground, uh, which is always uh, very nice to knock out a lot of those planes before they can even get in the air. Obviously, it is June 22nd, 1941, Operation Barbarossa. Uh, this had been delayed for quite some time, uh, mainly because the Italians got bogged down, down in Greece. The uh, Germans felt like they needed to protect their southern flank before they went into the Soviet Union, and for some other logistical reasons, but that ended up being fatal in some respects. Now, question whether they ever could have won this war, ultimately because of, first of all, Lend-Lease helping the Soviets, and then just because of the sheer production and manpower strength that the Soviet Union brought to bear uh, by about the mid, you know, mid-1942. Uh, it's just incredible. And when you go through the, a game like this and you learn more about a war like this, watching the early turns, it is almost impossible to believe that the Soviets recovered from losing millions and millions of men to surrendering, uh, to surrender, I should say, uh, most of their air force. They really didn't even have tanks at this point. Um, and for whatever else you can say, the Soviet people, what they endured and how they rallied back to win this war is really quite astound astounding. Uh, and it, you, that really comes uh, you know, to fruition. You can see it in this game because in the early turns, the German and Axis advantage is so incredible, and they're moving and taking so much land. Now, of course, the sheer size of the Soviet Union eventually uh, helped do the Germans in as well. That is a rather large country. <laughs> it's, what does it span, 14 time zones. Hey, Floor 1976, good to see you. David, good to see you as well. Now, if you're watching this, you probably already know quite a bit about Operation Barbarossa and the history of it. Uh, so let's jump in. Let's play the game. I'm not going to sit here and give you an hour-long lecture about the Eastern Front. Uh, let's talk, first of all, about what we're going to try to accomplish. What are we going to do? Uh, what are we not going to do? Uh, that some people, and I'm just going to be talking specifically about the game, not the historical war itself. Game-wise, what are we gonna, going to do? Well, we're going to try to stay somewhat historically accurate. Uh, there are certain strategies in this game uh, by very good German players or Axis, I should say Axis really, right? Uh, by very good Axis players where they take the second Panzers and they bring them to the south. That really is... You know, looking back with 2020 hindsight, probably the better move uh, to take more land. It's a it's better operating down here, uh, tank operating in the south. You can really get moving here. Now, as we start the game, you'll see the Soviets actually have their best troops down here in the Ukraine. It's a little slower going. It's a slog. Uh, no mods being used, David. No, we're just going to play the stock game. Uh, I know that there's a very good map mod uh, that people play 
uh, similar to the War in the Pacific one. I do like the War in the Pacific mod that I use that map mod, uh, but this game, I, I like the stock map. I, I'm just used to it, you know, probably the first 20 times I played this game, I played with the uh, stock map, and uh, so we're just going to run with that. Um, so anyway, the, the Soviets, their real strength is down here in the Ukraine. Now, historically, uh, the Ukrainians were actually quite happy to see the Germans. I'm, I'm generally speaking, you know, look, if you're Ukrainian, you're say we weren't, we didn't want the access there. Okay, that's fine. I'm just saying, generally speaking, I think the Ukrainians hated the Soviets more than they hated the Germans, at least at the start. Uh, but the Germans very quickly whittled away that goodwill, um, and you will see partisan activity pop up after a little bit of time. Now, we will be moving our security garrisons. We'll be splitting them up uh, to cover more area because the one thing you really have to avoid in this game is letting partisan activity behind your front lines cut your rail lines. Uh, if you get those rail lines cut, it slows you down to a point you will never take your objectives in 1941. And what are our, our objectives going to be? Well, I think the best way to play this game, and maybe historically, this it's just the opposite of historically what I think maybe should have been done. Um, in the game, our main objectives in 1941 are going to be Rostov and Leningrad, okay? And especially Leningrad. So let's go to the north. Leningrad has a lot of production, but there are these special rules also that I think lend you to going after this strategy, which is if you take Leningrad, then the Finns are unleashed, uh, a crazy Finnish storm from the north. As it is when you start the game, and let's you know kind of zoom in a little bit here, you see this dotted line, all right? The Finns cannot go south of this line until Leningrad falls. And that is to kind of simulate historically that the Finns were kind of in, but they weren't all the way in, right? I mean, they weren't going to fight a one-on-one -on -one war here unless it was became pretty apparent. What they really wanted to do is just take this land back uh, in their minds. You know, the, this land was theirs in their minds. They wanted to take it back, and they were going to take advantage of the German invasion of Barbarossa to do that. But to go any further down into uh, Soviet territory... Uh, they needed a little more, right? And so if Leningrad falls, that unleashes the Fens to go south. That is huge for you in a game like this. And why is that? Well, you have to leave troops back here uh, for some garrison. You also have, you know, you're going to be getting counterattacked. Well, you can leave the Fens to kind of defend against all that. And you can take Army Group North, wheel around here, and start to pressure Moscow from the north. If you can do that, you are in excellent shape. Um, also, you know, focusing on the north and focusing on the south, and I'll get to the south here in a minute, but while we're looking at Moscow, once the reinforcements start to come uh, from the east for the Soviets, they are really focused on defending Moscow. It gets thick as thieves in here with units by the time you get to Smolensk and then, you know, especially by Vyazma. Now, it all kind of depends how fast you get there, but you need to be at Moscow and near the gates uh, on by turn 17 or 18. That's when it gets muddy. It then, hey, Stanley, how's it going? Um, it then gets muddy and it becomes almost impossible to attack once it becomes muddy. So, you know, everyone knows about the snow, the blizzard in the Janu in January of 42. Uh, that makes it, uh, you know, almost impossible for the Axis to operate at all. You essentially have to go scurrying back to towns and urban areas to protect uh, the degradation of your forces. You'll be more focused on that. But even before the blizzard gets there, the mud starts to hit in early November, generally. 
and you can't really attack out of the mud. Again, you maybe have seen the pictures if you watch World War II in color or a documentary like that. You'll see the pictures of the Germans trying to push their vehicles through just that sloppy sl sludge that uh, the Soviet Union became in November and December of 1941. And so you know, pushing through and getting Moscow, we're going to try to do that. We're going to try to encircle it with our panzers so those reinforcements and supplies cannot get to it. Uh, but that's a more dicey proposition. If you really focus on getting Leningrad in the north, that is uh, achievable. That is something we should be able to do. Um, Stanley says, intriguing game, but maybe wait until number two. Indeed, uh, and we will be playing number two. My understanding is is that the ground, uh, the ground mechanics of two are going to be virtually identical. Uh, you know, they are going to make a lot of cosmetic improvements with the UI and whatnot, and they're going to change around the air war uh, to be like War in the West. And we are going to do War in the West, Stanley. I've had enough. Uh, people say do war in the west that we're going to go ahead and do that and i'm just going to start calling this the gary grigsby channel uh, because we will be running three grigsby games at one time but hey why not they're the best war games ever made uh so anyway you know if we focus on leningrad that is a very achievable goal and once we do that we get the added bonus of all these Finn troops now we haven't been talking much about the Finnish troops I really in the tutorial focused on the Germans uh, but we will go up there and we will spend a whole episode kind of going through what we're going to be doing in Finland and how that works um, so anyway you know we're gonna do everything we can to go get Moscow but that's not going to be our number one goal it is going to be a secondary goal. Now, another prime goal will be getting to Stalino and then Rostov. I think it is extremely important for gameplay purposes anyway, to get to Rostov, to cut off the, the production that happens at Stalino. And if we look at the factories here, you see all of the factories here at Stalino and kind of in this area right here around Rostov. Um, and so I like to try to push as much as I can to the river here okay and so we are going to try to get to the Don River here we are not going to try to get to Stalingrad uh, I do understand all of the arguments you know historians have gone back and forth for years about the importance of, or why Stalingrad was targeted um, we're not going to do that. I mean, for game per we could get into the whole historical argument. For game purposes, it's just not that important. Uh, we would be much better off, you know, flying through the Crimea here, taking Rostov, getting through the Crimea here, and getting down into the oil-producing regions. Uh, you know, and you could say that probably would have been smarter historically. Yeah, we're, it doesn't really matter for our purposes here. For the game, it's much better now. As we move a little far further to the north, in the south, uh, Kharkov, obviously, we want to be at Kharkov, Kursk, Stalino, Rostov. This kind of line right here, no later than when the mud hits in late 41. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of our initial goals. Now, this is not... You know, of course, you would want to get all the way here to the river, to the Don. Uh, that's kind of a, you know, a, an extended goal. Let's put it this way. And then I never cross the Don here and try to take Stalingrad. You know, why go to the Volga? You've got such a nice defensible position here that there's just no reason for it. And once you get a certain way into the south here, you're not really picking up anything new. There's nothing, you know, Stalingrad has a little bit of production. Uh, historically, you could argue the oil and production was coming up uh, the river, the Volga here, and, you know, that historically maybe changes things, but for the game purposes, we don't need that. Now, historically, uh, I actually subscribe to the idea that, uh, you know, Hitler and the German high command really should have targeted Moscow more. I think if Moscow would have fallen, uh, it's a psychological thing, right? Yes, the Soviet 
government could have moved, uh, Stalin and company could have moved to the Ural Mountains and tried to run the war from there. I just think psychologically, if Moscow would have fallen, they may have been much more inclined to come to the negotiating table. And, you know, at that point, the Germans could have said, okay, we're going to take, you know, to Smolensk or something. And maybe the, the Soviets would have agreed. Okay, but I keep going off on these historical side tangents. Um, as Stanley says, Stalingrad, way too far, and I agree. And just for the game purposes, since we are playing the game and we're not transported back to 1941, there's just no reason to go beyond the Don River, really. So Leningrad and to the south, Rostov. Those are our number one goals. But we, of course, will be pushing like madmen through the center. Now, I said those are our number one goals, yet we're not going to get gamey with the second panzer. Of course, historically, Guderian and company got, you know, uh, we're, we're pushing on Moscow uh, before they got the orders to then turn south. Uh, because in the south, the Soviets were putting up a much stiffer resistance, and the German high command, Hitler specifically, uh, really thought that this was an opportunity to pocket, and in the tutorials, I talked about pocketing a lot, to pocket one or two million more Soviet troops. Um, what you're really going to be trying to do, I say you, me, I guess, all of us here as we play this, is going to be trying to pocket, to surround uh, groups of Soviet units like this group here, and then secondarily this group here, uh, and get them to surrender by cutting them off from supply, giving them no retreat hexes, and we will be doing that with our panzers. Okay, well, now what do I do first when I start a game? Uh, well, I, I usually don't talk to myself like that and talk about all of our objectives. Uh, I've played this enough now, I know that those are, are going to be my objectives, whether I'm playing a human or um, the AI. Now, the AI is very good. Maybe we should actually get out of here for a second. I'll just show you how I'm setting up the game. So we'll exit the scenario and just look very quickly. Access human Soviet computer difficulty. I put it on hard. I think, you know, against any AI, you know, what's the point of putting on uh, impossible? Uh, challenging is probably good if you're first starting out. I mean, if you're first starting out, you know, put it on normal if you want. But uh, I think once you played for a little bit, hard is good. And what does hard mean? Well, we can see here uh, we will be playing with fog of war on and movement fog of war on. Now, what is movement fog of war? That just means you can't see, you know, once you start to, to indicate that you want to move a unit and it counts out your movement points, um, some t you know, if you do not have this on, you can kind of see what's out there in the fog of war because you're going to be moving there. With movement fog of war, you get none of that advantage. Uh, you are, you know, it's true fog of war. You have no idea until you get detection levels on something. Okay, uh, we are not going to lock headquarters support. We're going to be, you know, dealing with those support units ourselves. And we're going to go do something here in a minute, right off the top to deal with those support units. Uh, we are going to have uh, random weather. Uh, there are tables in the rule book, if you ever want to look at them, of what the die rolls. It's basically a 1 to 20 die roll of what your weather will be in each month of the war. Um, and, you know, by the time you get to January of 42, uh, if you roll 1 through 19, it's a blizzard. <laughs> and 20 is snow. So, you know, you may get a little, get lucky and just have a heavy snow. Uh, reduce blizzard effect? Nah. Uh, we're going to give the Soviets a combat bonus of attack plus 1. I like to do this whether I'm playing uh, the AI or I'm playing a human uh, because I think it's historically more accurate. Now, as a Soviet player, if we were playing the Soviet side, our idea is to always, you know, be retreating out and trying to get as much back and, and out of the way as we can. We're trying to avoid being uh, surrounded, right? Well, historically, that was not really how the Soviets approached things. Now, you can say that was smart, that was dumb, you know, we could get into all of that. Uh, but the idea is, is that the Soviets were oftentimes trying to counterattack. Uh, Stalin did not want them to be falling back. It's part of the reason they, you know, surrendered so many men, is the idea and the orders that were given 
were, you know, to attack at opportunity, uh, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. I mean, they, they were getting surrounded just over and over and over, and yet they continued to attack. So I give them an attack plus one to try to encourage attacking behavior of whether it be a human or the AI. Uh, CV mode, we're going to actually do better CV math. Uh, we talked a little bit about this in the tutorial. This just uh, takes into account more items of what the actual combat value is. You know, play it either way. Uh, ultimately, those are just uh, kind of summaries, rough guesstimates. Uh, it all depends on terrain and support units. I mean, there's a lot that goes into the ultimate uh, combat value, uh, but I do like to see better CV math if we can get it. Our difficulty level is hard. What does that mean? Our morale level is going to be operating at only 80%. Now we're talking about a 100 base here, right? So 80% and the Soviets get 125%. I mean, that's pretty substantial. Uh, that makes this very hard. I don't want you to think that uh, just because I'm playing this as a let's play and that I played the game a lot and won it you know, many times, uh, that we're going to win this. Uh, it's going to be up for grabs. When you play on difficulty hard and you give, you know, a plus 25 for morale, for more, for fort levels, for logistics levels, transportation, admin levels, uh, you're really, really, you know, the scales are balanced. Um, so if you become a, a good player, uh, this will always challenge you. Uh, and the AI is quite good, as you can imagine. With this, it's unlike War in the Pacific, where I can't even imagine writing the AI for that. There are so many possibilities. In this game, at least, if you're scripting the AI, you kind of know where the Axis player is going to go. I mean, there, there's only so many choices, right? Uh, and so Moscow, Leningrad to the south. Stalingrad or Kiev or Rostov. I mean, there's only so many choices. So the AI is actually very, very good in this game, I find, especially on the defense. Uh, that's one of the reason I, reasons I play the Axis. Um, I find that maybe, the, like all games, like all war games, right, generally the AI is better on the defense. Uh, and Stanley says, this is Tiller's Panzers on steroids, I think. <laughs> Indeed. And you know, I love John Tiller games. Uh, I love the Panzer campaigns. We'll probably play a Panzer campaigns on here. Uh, I have, I've been looking at Stalingrad uh, on Panzer campaigns, and I kind of want to play it. Now, they're going back and updating some of those Panzer campaigns for Tiller right now. Um, with even more enhanced graphics. So they just dropped uh, Panzer campaign Shelt which is sort of Operation Market Garden and whatnot. And um, so they updated, you know, the graphics even more. They keep getting better and better. Design War Studios, or I think that's DWS. I think that's it, uh, is, is updating those graphics. So anyway, uh, they have also announced over at Tiller that they're going to be doing a competitor to War in the East, essentially. They're going to put together like five or six of their can't, Panzer campaigns games into kind of this big war on the east. They said the map is five or six times bigger than any other Panzer campaigns that they've ever done. And some people have speculated this is essentially their competition for war in the east too. So anyway, okay. So we've got difficulty hard, uh, you know, pick scenario. I've said we're going to play the bitter end. I do like to have victory points. I just think it's nice to see how you're doing. You know, how the victory, uh, the VPs are going makes it a little more fun for me. It's essentially the same, exact same grand campaign. Okay, so what do I do first? Well, first of all, one thing I do is I go to map information and get the factories off here. I do turn on um, fort level. Oh, shoot. I don't want to build a fortified zone. What am I doing? Um, we do want to see the fort levels. There are the fort levels here so we can tell you know kind of maybe some soft spots here we would be looking it looks like almost all of these are two on the soviet side but there may be some down here that, that are ones and we could maybe find a soft spot here or there as you can see pretty much all the way down the line though the soviets have twos they do have a three here so it's always good to just kind of know here's a one 
that's by the mountains and another one right here where maybe we can kind of exploit that um, and another. So anyway, I like to have the fort levels on generally. I do like to have on enemy hexes so we can see kind of this dynamic front line as it happens. Azutech, thanks for the sub. I do appreciate it. Thanks for dropping by. Um, now we've got our security units out here, so on and so forth. Okay, let's go to our general's report. And we're going to look at our headquarters units. All right, and we're going to look at their support level. And so right now, we are starting with the default support levels, which are generally, I think it's one for cores, and it's two, I can't remember off the top of my head, uh, the Panzer cores are two, it appears, and the regular cores are one for the support level. Okay, well, we're going to go down here, and we are going to hit on support level, and we're going to make those all zero. All right, so if we look there, support level all zero. Now, why are we doing this? Well, we talked about in the um, tutorials how the game starts out very uneven about where support units are. Some cores have 20, some cores have, have three. Uh, when I say cores, uh, core headquarters. Anytime I say core, there aren't, there aren't core combat units. You know, when I say cores, they're always headquarters. So, you know, some of these cores have 20, 25, and then others have one or two. Well, I like to get them very evenly divide, divided out. You know, and we'll also look at different cores and where they're going and which ones are more likely to be taking in, uh, you know, a lot more incoming, you know what I mean, or doing more attacking. Some other ones may not need support units that much. They may just be flying, trying to get as much territory as possible, and they don't really need artillery, for instance, okay? So when I'm thinking of support units, I'm going to pull them all out of the divisions and pull them all out of the core level and try to get them up to the army level. And then once they're up at the army level, we it may still be a little uneven. Some armies, you know, the 16th or the 18th, let's say, uh, may have more than the 4th army. Uh, but generally it starts to even up once it gets to the army level. Uh, some we may take all the way to the army group level. I hope not. Uh, we'll see where we stand once we get to the army level, which would be uh, on turn two, everything would be essentially getting to the army level. Uh, we'll see where we are. Now, also with support units, I always like to put motorized, at least one motorized flak with every Panzer division that I can. Okay, so we'll be looking around for motorized flak, so motorized anti-aircraft, because you're gonna have, um, Floor's asking, am I going to change the leader of OKH? You read my mind, Floor. Uh, that's usually the second thing I get into. So I'll get into that in just one minute. Um, so right now we've got Halder. And Halder is not that great. But we are going to go look at that and talk about it. Because a lot of people do change that out. So anyway, um, I like to get at least one motorized flak unit into every Panzer division. So not even core level. I like to directly attach them to the division uh, so that I know that they're always committed and that I do never have a panzer division out there that now this isn't a huge concern early on but once you start to get to turn 10 or 12 or 14 and the Soviets do start trying to mount some you know bombing runs uh, or whatnot your your panzer should be way out in front right and you know, getting support units out to them could be a challenge. Sometimes they may not be in command range. It just depends, you know, it depends how fast we're moving. Um, so I do like them to always have some flak with them because you do not want to be losing willy-nilly panzers. Uh, they are your most important asset. Uh, I try not to attack with them early on much. Uh, you have to sometimes, of course, and you they will generally always be hasty attacks, and that would be just to push something more into a pocket that we think may escape. But usually I'm using my panzers to encircle and get around. They're just movement forces. Think of them uh, if you play Napoleonic or Civil War games or any, you know, 
game kind of before World War I, they're really your cavalry. You want them to surround uh, or to follow up uh, retreats. Uh, so just think of them as cavalry. And that's what the Germans did so effectively, right? Uh, tanks were still so new that in World War I, especially, people really didn't know what to do with them. You know, they just overran trenches, but they didn't really know how to tactically use them. Uh, by World War II, there had been German generals who had studied and studied uh, the the idea behind tank warfare, and it now seems kind of obvious, right, given the history of warfare uh, when it came to cavalry, what you should probably do with tanks, but the, the Germans were really the first ones to get there to say, oh, we should really use these uh, not just to blast away at uh, infantry units, but to actually use them like cavalry and use them for envelopment. And that's what we'll be trying to do. Okay, so back to support units. Uh, we've got these all to zero now. All right, that's great. Uh, but that's not the last thing we're going to do. We are going to, let's see, none, none. There we go. Now we're going to take all of our high commands here, uh, support level. We're going to move them all to nine. And this is how we're going to get everything to start getting pulled up to OKH, uh, to the Finnish High Command, Romanian High Command, Slovakian, Hungarian. These are your six High Commands. Um, and so all support units will be start, you know, sucked up that way. And then once we get them to the Army level, then we'll push them back down. Now, uh, Floors 1976 asked a very good question. Okay, so we've got this how we want it. Um, now, don't forget, support units are still down here. Uh, this what we just did will not start until we resolve turn one and we're going into turn two so that all happens in the what's called the logistics phase and so they will still be right down here to help us in turn one uh, we will still have plenty that will be at the core headquarter level for turn two and then by turn three we'll push them all the way back or many many of them back down and so we're never gonna um, not have support unit support uh, just because we're pulling them to the top now the question came up are we going to replace Halder and let's go to OKH so now a very popular thing to do is to replace uh, the overall commander of German forces here at OKH, and that is General Oberst Franz Halder. And why would we replace Halder? Well, first of all, he doesn't cost much to replace, and he's not a very good general. Uh, and so <laughs> the, those are, you know, quick, quick hits. Those are the two reasons. He's pretty bad at mech. He's pretty bad at infantry. Uh, his, you know, initiative isn't that good. And his admin is fantastic. And that is why I do not replace General Holder. Now, I do understand why people do. It doesn't really cost. I mean, you know, we've got 30 points here. Uh, I think in, in this game, they're called, um, they're not called political points. In War in the Pacific, they're called political points. Over here, I think they're called, uh, gosh, I can't remember now, something points. Anyway, they're how you change things around. You change commands, you can pay points, you can change generals, they're called points, um, or they cost points, I should say. And you see that, dismissal cost, three. Well, let's hit on this, and let's see who we could replace him with. We could replace him with Von Klug, Von Bach, Von Runstead, so the Von, the Von family. Um, no Von Traps here. Uh, so we've got... You know, pretty dang good generals. Uh, all of these guys are good. Most people replace him with Von Klug because Von Klug has this 9988, you know, 47. Pretty dang good. Uh, whereas Von Bach and Von Rundstedt, uh, a little bit better uh, with the mech, uh, but not quite as good with the initiative here. Um, and so, you know, I do see the arguments for replacing him, but ultimately up here at OKH, the admin score is really the most important. Now, if you fail, at, so this game does command checks, like hundreds of them per turn, but if you fail one down, let's say at the core level, so your core 
general fails his command check. That is on a one to 10 dice roll, okay? And then it's compared to his number for whatever they're checking, whether that be initiative. Uh, it's actually one to nine. Uh, there is no 10, okay? So it's a, a one to nine dice roll. So, you know, he is basically going to fail, let's say, if you rolled a seven, eight, or nine, uh, but he'll pass six and under. Okay, so he's got a pretty decent chance of passing. Uh, admin, he's essentially always going to pass unless there's some kind of modifier. All right, mech and infantry, not so much. This is if he was at the core level, we would be rolling against a nine. Uh, and Stanley says the sound of music. Yes, it's one of my wife's favorite movies. Uh, big Julie Andrews fan, so I had to throw the Von Trapp reference in there. Um, so anyway, once you go from core to army level, now, so if we fail on the core level, it goes up to the army level, and you have another chance to pass. So your army general then would have a chance to pass that test. Well, when you get up there, though, you're not rolling 1 to 9, you're rolling 1 to 19, okay? Or 1 to, they call it 1 to 10 and 1 to 20. Uh, there are no 10s in this game. So, well, that's a good question. I guess maybe you could fail if it rolls a 10 here, all right? So let's call it 1 to 10 and 1 to 20. Um, so once you get to the army level, you're rolling against a 20. So even though he has a 9 admin, now all of a sudden you are only got a half chance of passing, okay? Then let's say you get to up to the army group level. Then you're going up to 40. And I think at the army group level and OKH level, that's as high as it goes is, is against a 40-sided die, right? And so as you go up and you could multiply the chances, you are getting a better chance of passing those tests as it moves up the levels just because you get another role, you know, and if nothing else, even at the top level, if he's a nine admin, he's got essentially a 25% chance to pass it. And so 25%, if you went down to the army level, he's got a 50% chance uh, down here at the core level, I guess he's got a 90% chance Add all those up, you know, uh, but uh, so really up here at OKH, some of these things like initiative uh, and mech and infantry, when you get all the way up to the OKH level, they are, you know, the difference between a six and a nine at the core level is huge, right? It gets less and less of a big difference once you get up. When we're talking on a 40-sided die, let's say, that gets rolled, now you're starting to talk about a much smaller uh, difference. And for that reason, uh, myself and some uh, people that I know are really, really good players, they do not worry about OKH. And in some respects, they don't even worry about the army group level that much. Now, you don't want a totally crappy general up there. And Halder's not great, uh, but he does have that good admin score. And going up to OKH, uh, OKH, it's my understanding, a, a big percentage of the time, well, I say a big percentage, I don't want to say it that way, a majority of the time is my understanding that OKH tests would be admin tests, and so Halder is actually not that bad. But anyway, what I was going to say, some people that I know are very, very good at this game actually like to keep their really good generals either at the core or the army level. That's where they have the most effect. That's where their big, big ratings actually make a huge difference. Once you get to the army group level or the OKH level, it's not as big. And so that leads me to the second thing I wanna do here in the setup. So I've decided this time, we're just gonna kind of set everything up, look at the map, talk about big objectives, um, you know, go through, get to our support level, that set up, and now we're gonna go through and look at our generals from the core level to the army level and then army group level. We've already looked at OKH. We're gonna keep Halder there for now. Um, you know, as we get a more good new generals, it may be the case that we, we move him out uh, because we can afford to. As it is right now, we don't have, uh, we, I should back up. We have great generals on the German side, relatively speaking, compared to everyone else, uh, certainly fantastic leadership when compared to the Soviets uh, or compared to the Romanians or compared to the Finns, you know, whoever you want to compare them to. Um, 
but we do have some cores that don't have the best leadership and then we also have the fourth army that does not have great uh no that's not true von klug is here for now um let's but let's start up to the let's start up to the north and let's look at each one now up here we have wadrig he's a 5.0 so let's kind of flip through these and get a feeling of what our our average score is here for some of these generals von both now we're going to want to replace von both 4.6 so anything under i think really like a 5.7 or a 5.8 now that does it really matters what the mixture of that is right these guys are infantry generals so if they just have like a one mech score and that's what's dragging down their average that doesn't really matter let's go look at von both uh, and see what makes up his score so you know he's aver average just forget about political for now all you will know that because it'll tell you that in the dismissal cost the higher the political the higher the dismissal cost uh morale average initiative average admin average okay and he's average infantry uh what really drags him down here is mech um i say really drags him down you know fives are not that great for a german general uh so you know, but this is dragging him under a five or under being an average five general. Uh, but he's an infantry general. So, you know, his mech score in some respects, it just doesn't matter. You can kind of throw that out uh, for infantry or ground troop. And you see his restrictions. He is a ground general. That makes sense. Cost five. We still may replace him. The one core is very important. I've said our main <clears throat> objective is to take Leningrad and so you know if we look at the one core here obviously the one core is incredibly important this is going to be one of our northern prongs here that really needs to move fast uh, from an infantry perspective so let's go see who we could replace him with uh, before we replace him we're going to go look at more uh, but who who is not taken here well, you have probably the best German ground general, and that is Modal. Uh, I think historically Modal ended up leading the fourth army early on, uh, the entire fourth army. Uh, but Modal is fantastic. One of the uh, great German generals up there with von Manstein uh, and Guderian. Uh, as you know kind of the best the creme de la creme of the German officer corps uh, so modal you know we want to get him into the action very quickly this may be a place to put him uh, he's got a nine infantry an eight initiative uh, seven on the admin nine on morale he's just a fantastic general and he doesn't cost that much he's one plus five so he's six points essentially uh, or he's one to get in there, five to replace the other guy. He's six total points. That's just nothing. We will definitely be putting him into the game immediately. And he's the kind of guy you want on that core or army level with these ratings. He's going to essentially pass every test. Um, another guy like that is Rendeluk. And Rendeluk <clears throat> is another very good infantry commander. He's an eight. Uh, he's got a seven initiative and eight. So he's just a little bit less good than modal, yet he is very, very good. Uh, but he does cost 21 points plus the five that we're going to have for the dismissal costs. That takes up almost all of our political points over here. Uh, we have 30. This would be 26. Okay. Um, Hollett is also very good, and he's a two plus five. We will get him into the action right away. Uh, we could put von Manstein up here, but we have von Manstein right where we want him. 